Welcome to Leading with Empathy and Allyship, where we have deep, real conversations to build empathy for one another and to take action to be more inclusive and to lead the change in our workplaces and communities. I'm Melinda Brianna Epler, founder and CEO of Change Catalyst and author of How to Be an Ally. I'm a diversity, equity, and inclusion speaker, advocate, and advisor. You can learn more about my work and sign up to join us for a live recording at ally.cc. All right, let's dive in. Well, hello, everyone. Today, our guest is Caitlin Holloway, a founding partner at Alexis Ohanian's uh, venture capital firm, 776, where she invests in people-first companies and manages the firm's pro programs, including 2% growth and caregiving commitment and operator and residence program. So today we'll be talking about the role of venture capital in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging across the tech industry, how the venture capital system can evolve to be more people and culture focused, create new opportunities and access for wealth um, for underrepresented founders and invest in companies that shape the future of work in a positive way. So hello, my friend, welcome. Well, hi, Melinda. Thank you so much for having me on the show. You know, I'm a big fan of your work uh, in oh. general, and this podcast has been absolutely a shining light through the last, uh, you know, rough few years here. So I'm really excited to be here, and I'm so grateful for the inclusion. Oh, awesome. Um, I'm excited for you to be here. And of course, I'm a good, big fan of yours and I've loved working with you over the years. Um, and before we jump in um, to our conversation for our YouTube audience, our ASL interpreters today are Dana and Andrea. And, and then Caitlin, let's describe ourselves for anybody who's blind or low vision as well. So I'll start. I'm, I'm a white woman with long blonde and red hair wearing black and white glasses and a floral green, different shades of green uh, sleeveless shirt. It's so pretty too. I, I oh. like it. it goes very well with your plants in the background. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So I am, I am also a white woman. Um, I have long blonde hair, although it looks red today for some reason. Um, I'm wearing a black shirt. I have on my big old Beats headphones so that I can best hear uh, Melinda here. And uh, I'm wearing my signature uh, gold chain around my neck. <laughs> hmm. I didn't know that was your signature gold chain. I just made that up. I oh, just okay. decided it's signature. I've just decided I've made the call live. This is my okay. signature piece. You heard it first here. <laughs> the important stuff, hard hitting. <laughs> so as you all may have guessed, Caitlin and I have known each other for a while since it's, I think 2016. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. been a long time. Yeah. Um, when we worked together at Reddit on a DEI strategy with Steve and Alexis and the rest of the executive team, it feels like, I was thinking about this, it feels like ages ago when I first walked into the Reddit office and met you and Steve, like, I think there were maybe 100, 150 employees at the time. It was a small company at the time. So it was, it, it does feel like ancient history. Uh, yeah. it, and even just in the time that we worked together there, um, together on that strategy, we grew from about that 150 mark all the way up to 750. I don't know wow. if you even registered that, that track and change while we were there wow. together, but we grew a lot in a really yeah. short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe we'll get to that in a little bit, but I think that's really important that we, that you reached out at that moment, um, as Reddit was just starting to, to really grow and take off, um, to, to work on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So. So flash forward today, and now you're working with Alexis on, as a founding partner of 776. So I want to I want to start with your story um, first. We always start um, with a little bit of background on where you grew up, how you ended up getting to where you are today. Oh, that is that is such a big question. Um, I appreciate you asking, and I will do my best to keep it somewhat uh, uh, short. Um, so. Let's see, I, I've been on this earth for, for over 40 years now, um, and I have not yet sorted out a quick and easy answer to this question. Um, <laughs> so let's see, um, maybe, maybe I start with who I am first or who I feel I am today. <laughs> hmm. um, 
from a, from a work perspective, uh, I'm an early stage investor and I am a recovering HR executive. Um, <laughs> back in early 2020, I transitioned from operator to investor um, and have had the pleasure of building this brand new venture capital firm called 776, as you mentioned, with my longtime business partner, Alexis Ohanian. Um, I am passionate about helping founders and their leadership teams build scalable, inclusive organizational cultures from day one. Um, thriving cultures enable people to produce beautiful, innovative products that change the way the world operates. And I'd like to think that I can help our founders get there faster uh, because of my background. Um, mm. And so I, when I say I've been a recovering HR executive, um, mm -hmm. I, I've worked in the trenches of uh, what we now know to be Web 2 uh, for well over a decade, um, but I wasn't always in tech. So uh, prior to, to making the leap um, into just the world of tech generally, I actually worked in film. So I worked at Pixar Animation Studios for uh, several years, over five, and uh, for, for fun, dating myself facts. Uh, this was back when Steve Jobs was still around and active at the studio. Um, and Ed Catmull was our, our president at Pixar. And I learned a lot, a lot about what I, I still use to this day about building inclusive cultures from that moment in time in my, my career. And then all of the things that, that brought me to Pixar um, are wide and varied as I found myself and figured out my career um, in you know my, my early days of post-college. So I've literally, done everything. Uh, I was a public education teacher, so I, I taught first and second grade. I taught high school at one point. I worked in the hedge fund world. I was in real estate. Uh, I worked uh, actually for a police station at one point. Uh, I, I was the fingerprint gal, and I was the police chief's assistant up in Humboldt County. So wow. I, you name it, I've done it. But uh -huh. all of those things uh, had some sort of impact on on my my worldview and and really what I am most most passionate about, as I mentioned, is helping uh, build very inclusive and and uh, thriving cultures that scale. Mm. Well, I, I think that it's I, I think it's fascinating. I, I, there are so many people that um, think that they, young people that think that they, you know, they have one track, you know, I want to go here and get here. And, and the reality is, I mean, my, my, my background is equally kind of circuitous. Yeah. I went all over the place before I ended up where I am and I'm probably not done. Right. I'm still going to yeah. go on to something else. Right. And, and, um, and I, I think that's really, really important. And it also adds to our experiences. It adds to our diverse set of experiences and, um, that really make innovation happen. So I love it. Yeah. Um, I, so I should I'm, mention, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. I, sh I should also mention, so that's my work uh, yeah. side of myself. And I know that, you know, as we talk about the intersectionality that is us and human and identity, um, I'm the other big part of who I am is I'm a mom. So I have two little boys at home here. I've got Luca and Juno. They are seven and four. Um, I, they are my other startups. Uh, so <laughs> technically I have three startups right now. I have 776, I've got Luca and I've got Juno. Um, and so between the three of those, my dance card these days is pretty full. I wish uh, that there was more room for other things that make me whole, uh, mm. like travel and, and, you know, music and art and all of those things that, that we love to love. Uh, but here we are. So, uh, yes, that pretty much sums me up these days. Yeah. And I was, I was surprised you didn't mention that earlier. So I'm glad you yeah. did. Um, <laughs> and because so many of us, including me have kind of watched them grow up and during the pandemic via Instagrams, <laughs> yes. my little stars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and I believe they were even on, uh, on, uh, CNN or something, right? Or, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. They were. Yes. My, my, uh, my partner, my spouse, Ben, he, uh, started something through the pandemic where he was making coffee, uh, this really bougie pour over coffee for our neighbors and all of the first, uh, responders and, um, frontline workers in the very early days of the lockdowns here in San Francisco. And, uh, he and the boys would serve it to maintain social distance. They would serve it out of our kitchen window with a, a very long extended, um, like grabber hand that was an arm. It, it looked like a, a gorilla arm. And so it was called gorilla arm coffee. And we, it was, it was entertaining and it was our only contact with the outside world. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I think it brought a lot of joy to all of us, even though we couldn't, you, know, you were across the city, we couldn't partake, but it still brought joy. Yeah. Um, joy is important. And, and especially then. Yeah. Um, 
so I want to ask you, you said a recovering um, HR professional, and I, and I think you still use a lot of your people and culture skills. And how do, how um, do you see that intersection with venture capital? Yeah. Um, it, you know, the, the reality is, is I think that I think that once you go HR, you never really go back. Um, and so maybe maybe I should amend my uh, my introduction to not say recovering, uh, because I very much feel uh, that venture is actually an extension of my HR work. Um, I've, I've thought about this for a long time, several years actually, before I I ultimately made the the transition from operator to investor. Um, and you know. Here, here's some framing. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd sat on the executive side uh, of the of the table, so to speak, uh, for mm -hmm. well over a decade, and I thought that I had um, a pretty unique perspective on the role of investor. And the more exposure I got to venture capitalist by being on the startup side, you know, needing capital, going through different fundraises, sitting in board meetings, uh, needing to to tap and and call on our investors at various stages of of uh, evolution through the different companies I had worked for. And um, this is going to sound not very kind, uh, but the, the more I worked with our venture capitalists, the more I realized how they weren't really terribly helpful outside of the general business uh, mm. side or the business advice um, mm. and or making introductions to other investors. Um, and so the, the, the thing that was rubbing for me was that the, the standard line of venture is, you know, how can I help? Uh, mm -hmm. Investors view themselves generally as very, very, very helpful. Um, but the reality was, is I hadn't really experienced that. Um, and that's not to say that they weren't great people or lovely people or, or, you know, weren't helpful in their particular, you know, areas of expertise. But for me, and, and again, knowing the lens that I had of, of, of being an HR professional was that most of the challenges in our organizations uh, were really people problems. Um, they weren't generic yeah. business problems uh, that, you know, and, and again, this might sound not very kind, but that an Ivy League business or finance school degree could actually help us solve. Um, but these were like real meaty people problems. They were things like, you know, how to hire, how to shrink, how to manage, how to develop, how to level up, um, how to engage, how to retain our talent, how to manage and, uh, uh, manage conflict more specifically, mm -hmm. how to fire folks. And, and, and yes, to the point of our conversation, how to build a diverse and inclusive team. And, mm -hmm. and here's the, here's the zinger for me. Uh, these weren't problems unique to one particular company. Um, I experienced them at every company that I had worked at um, and with, but, but it was beyond even my own experience. This was, this is across the board across industries. Um, it didn't matter the company size or stage. Uh, these were really the problems that organizations were, were bringing to the table and were trying to solve uh, that were stopping or inhibiting their potential growth and success and mm -hmm. creating the, those outsized returns. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I think that after the initial check is written from a, a VC firm into an organization, the best way for an investor to really, really be helpful is to know how to help with these people problems or these challenges that you know are are not written in any book because they are messy like us as humans. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so once I started to connect this this dot or I started to kind of form this this observation, um, I started to look around and and look into the world of venture capital. And th this was back; it was shortly after we met. Um, probably 2018, 2019. And there were really only about a handful of investors that I saw that actually had a real HR operator skill set. Um, you know, they, there were a few, so I don't want to, I don't want to uh, neg them at all, but that was it. it. It was a really, really small cohort of people. And, and so I, I saw the gap and I did what I know how to do best. Um, I just started to write, I, I wrote out a proper thesis on why the natural progression of an HR career or the career development path for an HR professional should not actually stop at that, you know, VP of HR or the CHRO role, but it should actually be straight from the boardroom mm -hmm. onto the venture capital side. Um, and to be more specific, not just as, uh, as a HR professional in venture, but actually as an investor, as a proper check writer, because mm -hmm. the, when you really look at where, um, this gets into several different prongs here, but 
But I think that the real influence and the real opportunity for impact with folks that have the people background or skill set, um, the impact to to change or to uh, uh, influence an entire industry um, is at the investor level, not just at the practitioner level. Um, I have a whole soapbox about the wealth gap and and you know who the founders are and what they mm. they look like and what their perspectives are perspectives are and and what the the funders uh, look like and what their yeah. backgrounds and perspectives are. But uh, I'll save that for later in the conversation. So anyway, mm. long story short, I I I created this idea, this thesis around the HR professional growth path, and and then I wanted to go out and investigate it, and so. I marched my my little hiney down to Sand Hill Road and like a fool, I started knocking on the doors of the different firms. Um, weirdly hmm. enough, they 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 opened. Uh, they, you know, people were curious. They were like, "Hello, what are, what are you doing?" <laughs> and I was like, Hi. "People don't knock on these doors. What are you talking about?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I uh, I was surprised. I, I was let in, um, but I I was not surprised at their reaction. Um, I got a lot of no's. Mm -hmm. I got a few, well, you can be our HR lady. Um, I even got a few kind of uh, snarky investors who wanted to tell me why I was wrong um, Mm -hmm. and why this idea was completely out of line, uh, which I found fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, One one investor who I will not name uh, even went as far as to say that a woman of my age should uh, not be so audacious. Um, and I was like, excellent. Oh. Thank you for the feedback, oh. uh, noted. Um, so I, I, I came back basically, I, I, I went and I, I had this little tour of duty that, that was not in hindsight, very well planned out. And I kind of tucked my tail between my legs and I, I went back to Alexis, you know, he, he had left Reddit a few years prior and, um, we, we had remained very close and, um, and I, I just asked him, honestly, I said, what, what did I do wrong here? What, you know, mm-hmm. what am I, am I really this far off base? How did I miss the mark? And, um, lucky for me, Alexis had been waiting and watching. Uh, he, he knew what I was capable of. He knew what he thought was, was maybe off or wrong about the industry. And, um, he knew that I had to kind of go out for myself and really see what was out there and, and get a better sense of the ecosystem. And so when I, when I came back to him, uh, and said, what, what gives man, he, he just looked at me and he was like, let's go build a new one. Let's go and mm-hmm. do it. And I was like, great. <laughs> I could do that. And I hadn't even considered it. So um, that that's kind of the long ranty version of, of, of my perspective on HR uh, playing with venture capital. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And um, for, for those who um, are listening or watching that don't have a, a good sense of the the, the problem here. I want to just kind of paint that for 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 a second here. Um, so as as Caitlin, you know, um, but the audience may not know that that Wayne, my husband and co-founder, and I have been working on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the tech industry for years. And and part of that work has been in the venture capital ecosystem because. Um, you know, it really starts there. Um, so we've worked with VCs and startup companies, uh, startup programs, and 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 startups as well. And um, there's about Uh, less than 5% of venture capital goes to pretty much anyone who is not a white man. Um, And um, so that's women, that's people of color, that's, that's everybody else, right? And so it's, that is, that is a deep problem in and of itself. And then on the other hand, we have tech companies that, um, that have a severe lack of diversity as well. And they grow um, big and they, and when they get big is when they realize, ah, wait, I have, we have a problem. And, And so many people ask me, why? Why does? Why is that such a big problem in in the tech industry? And it's because over the years, most of the big tech companies came about because white men had an idea. They were able to work for free on it for some time, which which it requires some privilege, requires some wealth, right? Yeah. And until they were able to sell the idea to wealthy white men, right? And then they once they sold the idea, then they sell the idea, then they have to scale pretty quickly. And so when that, that happens, when you're hiring so quickly, you're hiring your friends, and then your friends are hiring your friends, and then you end up with a company that looks a lot like those founders. You end up with a company that is um, severely lacking in diversity. And, and then when that company IPOs or has another type of exit, all of those folks become wealthy, 
and a lot of them become investors, right? So it per completely perpetuates that system. Um, and so there's a lot of room for disruption and a lot of ways to address it. Kaylin has talked about several of them from diversifying venture capital partners, who's, who's making those decisions, who's gaining that, that wealth from those decisions and um, to supporting founders to build companies that are diverse, equitable, and inclusive, and then also diversifying portfolios and really supporting underrepresented founders. So, um, and I, the, and Another piece of it is I uh, interviewed Dr. Vivian Ming on a recent episode, and we talked about trust and that we tend to trust people who are like us, right? So um, we tend to trust people who have similar backgrounds, um, identities, cultures, schools, and so on. And so we have this kind of myth of meritocracy um, in, in the tech industry where people get there based on merit. And, and also we have kind of pattern matching where we're looking for similar patterns like those original founders, right? So that there is a, there's a, um, a, a again, there's a big um, need for disruption and, and there's several, several folks that are working on this. So, um, Kaylin, I, and let's let's talk about some of the um, some of the the ways that, to address it that you brought up earlier. You've been on both the startup side and now the venture capital side. Where do you see opportunities to really move the industry when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging? Oh, there, there are so many, and I wish that we had so many more uh, hours <laughs> to talk about this. Um, and, and we have. Um, I first of all, I, I just want to say thank you for um, setting the table here by describing the the system and how it has worked. Um, I, I realize that 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 context is really really helpful for folks who are not as familiar with how the the whole you know quote unquote ecosystem works and. Um, you know, I, I've heard people say things like, you know, the system is broken. Um, mm -hmm. And I've heard others, and unfortunately, I cannot remember uh, where I heard this, otherwise I would cite them. But, you know, they, they've said things to the effect of uh, the system isn't broken, it was built that way. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. I very, very much feel that way about venture capital. And so yeah. uh, I really appreciate you laying out kind of that flywheel effect that happens. Um, and, and the privilege required to even just be able to explore, you know, an idea when somebody has that little thought mm -hmm. bubble, uh, for so many people, that little thought bubble turns into, you know, being written down in a notebook and put away somewhere because there are other obligations and they don't have the privilege, um, that, that others do. And, and you can see, you know, you and I, we both live here in San Francisco and we've been here for some time. And so, you know, to, to see, the wealth that this town has brought to people mm. is absolutely phenomenal. The amount of money uh, that has been generated, that has created generational wealth for many um, is absolutely fantastic. Now, how that wealth has been distributed mm -hmm. uh, because of this system is a lot less heartening. And, mm. and, and you see it show up in you know, the, the, the millionaires that have been minted over even just the last 10 years. Um, it is, it is very homogenous. And so I, I, I just want to say thank you for, for kind of painting the picture of how the system was built, uh, because this is not that, you know, it, it was something that developed and then, and then we just kind of didn't keep a mindful eye on it, or we weren't intentional about things as we went along the way. Uh, no, it was 100% built that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, mm -hmm. it was by design. And yeah. so our opportunity is to make adjustments to that. And um, I, something else that I think is important to say here is that there is room for both. And I think that, that um, when I say both, I haven't articulated what both means. I mean, uh, I'm not trying to take the capital out of venture capital, to be very mm -hmm. clear. Uh, you know, there, there is a, a wonderful space for nonprofit work and there is a wonderful space for, uh, for, for folks to, to have impact, you know, in many, many different ways. Something that I am personally very deeply passionate about is adjusting the wealth gap. And this is something that I learned um, as I was an HR practitioner, uh, something that I felt very uh, proud of in my work as an operator was ensuring that every organization I worked with, every organization I worked for, uh, every company that I advised for did not have uh, a wage gap um, mm -hmm. across all of our different uh, in, you know, communities within our companies. 
Um, and I was very, very proud of that for a long time. And the challenge was, is that I could only impact that one organization at a time or a few, right. You know, if I was, uh, in a position of advising others and, mm -hmm. and so the opportunity of kind of swimming upstream to venture is now, you know, at 776, we have a portfolio of, uh, you know, over 80 companies. And so I've been able to build out and take some of those, those tools and templates and best practices around creating equitable, uh, compensation strategies and plans to so many more than I could, you know, actually sit through and cycle as, mm -hmm. as, as just an operator, someone who's going in to say like, Hey, let's do this. You have to get the executive buy-in. You have to go and do all of these things. You have to make sure that the board's on board, um, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that the opportunity that we have to change, uh, the, e even something as small as let's start with, with the wage gap, because there's a difference between the wage gap and the wealth gap. And, the wage gap is our cash compensation or the components of our, our cash compensation as an employee. And I'm speaking very specifically about tech right now because there, there are um, a few different modes of compensation here. But if we're talking mm -hmm. about just our salaries and understanding uh, what benchmarks are, understanding what uh, uh, career pathing looks like, uh, ensuring that we have levels that are set and, and mutually agreed upon, that we have performance management in place, that we have managers that are equipped with management training so they know how to develop and grow their team in the appropriate way, that those feedback cycles and loops are in place. And a lot of this, I'm, you're smiling and nodding because a lot of this is the work that we got to do together uh, mm -hmm. when we were at Reddit. And so really understanding that this isn't just about, um, you know, hiring, right? Which is what a lot of people think this, oh, it's, it's a hiring problem. It's a funnel problem. Uh, no, it is so deep. And, and when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, first of all, those are separate things. These mm -hmm. are not, you know, we, we, we like to say them really quickly or, or lump them into an acronym, but these are, these are separate initiatives that impact different parts of our business, but all of them uh, need to be influenced by, supported by uh, the entire organization. And so training and education is a big part of, of all of this. And so Sorry, I digress. I was talking about the wage gap. So we can, we can, we, we manage our salaries, right? That's something that we have control over. And so again, you know, by, by me moving from an operator in-house at one company and running my playbook or, or, you know, working with that, that, that founding team and that leadership team to develop the right compensation strategy for that organization, I can now do this at scale. So, so moving from one to one to one to many. This is, by the way, just to interject, this is why I do what I do too. And I moved from being an executive to um, being a consultant and working with several different companies to create change. Same, same reasons. Yeah. It, it, and it, it is, it is very rewarding. Um, I feel, I definitely feel the reach uh, that, that we both can have by doing it this way. And I think that, uh, you know, by I'm oh, sorry, we now have a car alarm going off. Um, <laughs> okay, we're good, sorry. Uh, the joys of living in the city. Yes. Um, I, so yes, moving from that one-to-one -one model to the one-to-many model, uh, we, we can have a bigger impact. But if I, if I go back and, and investigate or share a little bit more about the wealth gap, uh, that lives beyond our, our paychecks, right? Our day-to-day, -day, you know, what's coming into the bank, um, which is, again, I don't want to undersell the wage gap. That's very important. We got to make mm -hmm. sure that's locked in and square. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the component, especially in tech, that we give a little less consideration to is, is the part that can actually create wealth. And that is the equity side of the equa equation. So uh, oftentimes organizations will um, offer their employees stock options. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and those stock options uh, have the, the potential to either go wind down to nothing at all, absolutely nothing, uh, which is the fun of, of the startup ride, or can create incredible wealth for people. Uh, and so as an HR practitioner, what I was noticing was the real opportunity with equity or stock options were for that those folks who, who lived on that top quartile of the cap table. This wasn't everyone in the organization. You know, you could be employee number 5,000 and have, you know, 500 shares or, or options. That's really not going to make a significant impact on your personal wealth, although it's lovely. Uh, it, it's not life-changing money like it would be for those people who were hired very early on 
or hired in to particular roles. Um, and, and so I, again, I, I took my little detective magnifying glass to this when I, when I started to connect some dots and I was like, wait a minute. So who lives on that top quartile of the cap table and how do those folks get there? And so I started looking at that and I was like, okay, well, these are, and, and Melinda, you, you, you painted the perfect picture. Uh, these tended to be the friends of the founders. They, this tended to be the immediate first degree network uh, of those folks that had that initial, you know, harebrained idea that they were going to turn into something. Mm -hmm. And they all had the same privilege. These were people who could start at a startup when the cash wasn't, the cash flow wasn't very high. So the resources available from a cash compensation perspective, uh, you had to, in order to take an offer that was high on equity and low on cash, which are typically those early stage offers, you had to be at a place in your life where you could take on a lot of risk. Your mm -hmm. appetite for risk has, has to be massive. That usually means that you either come from wealth and so you, you, you have some sort of backstop or you've created wealth previous in your life for yourself, right? So that you can pay your rent, pay your mortgage, whatever those things are, or you were young enough uh, to be able to not have a lot of the, the financial burdens in life, like children, uh, you know, a mortgage, having to care for, for uh, your parents or, or, you know, disabled adults in your life or, or other things. And so what you weren't seeing were a lot of parents or caregivers. What you weren't seeing were people that did not come from the same college or university that the founders came from. What you weren't mm -hmm. seeing were, as to your point, almost everyone that wasn't uh, that cisgendered straight white male, um, which tended to be that founder archetype. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that, that had an impact on that top quartile of, of the cap table uh, was industry. And so typically the, the folks that are early coming on to build a software product, I'm talking about technology here, um, are the folks that come from, you know, deeply, uh, you know, very, very highly educated backgrounds. Uh, and so these are your engineers, your product managers, uh, maybe a designer, if you're lucky, uh, got, got up there, that first one, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. But what you weren't seeing were all of the, the um softer skilled uh, functions that typically were hired later in an organization's history. So marketing, uh, HR, and guess what? This is where the majority of professional females careers uh, were living. And so even if you were the first, you know, marketing hire, and, and even if you were the VP of marketing or the CMO, uh, you typically were hired after that life-changing wealth moment, because you, you the company was more stable, they were more secure and they given away a lot more of their equity. And so mm -hmm. uh, th th there are so many things that we can extrapolate from that, but long story short, I was looking at the top quartile of the cap table and I said, ah, so, something's amiss there. Uh, how, how can I impact that top quartile, those early hires that are made? But again, not by going into the organization myself and trying to have influence over that early founding team. Uh, but I was like, well, if the founders themselves had these kind of first principles going into it and wanted to build a diverse and inclusive workforce from day zero independently because of their lived experiences, that would dramatically change where that wealth was created. And then you, you, I'm skipping over a lot of these fine points here for the sake of time, but, but when, when, you, when I started to question like, okay, so we got that, that top quartile of the cap table making a lot of money, we have the founder who's making those selections. So if we could tweak that founder profile just a little bit and, mm -hmm. and, and support them, that would actually change the downstream effects. And so again, you're, you're one to manying this. Um, well, who, who picks those founders? Oh, it's the funders. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then you start looking at the archetype of the funders with the venture mm -hmm. capitalists and you go, oh, well, shoot, dang, that all looks kind of the same too. Yeah. And so uh, long story short, I, I keep saying that and I'm not doing a long story short. It's long story long. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a big I problem. <laughs> it's a huge problem. So, yeah. so, you know, Alexis and I have, have thought about all of the many, many different ways that, that venture could potentially shift or change. Uh, and, and we've identified a few of those problems in this conversation, which are how do we diversify and, and bring more perspectives into the, the, the check writing positions, those investor roles? How do we uh, shift that, that standard archetype for a founder? Mm -hmm. Because then they will impact who gets hired and who those, those early employees are. So I forget the question you asked. I'm so sorry. 
Oh no, that's that's it's, it's, you answered it, and um, and I want to just say that uh, to our audience that there's a great study that uh, Angels and Carta did together um, called Table Stakes, and, and we'll share um, the link to that. That that lays out this this exactly what Caitlin just just shared in and there, and there's some um, there's some great tables that you can look at both um, in terms of gender and in terms of race and and that that equity issue. Uh, interestingly, it also is a, an issue when you look at founder equity, so not just employee equity, but also founder equity that um, where um, just, for example, women equity holders overall are they're 13% of women founder equity holders, but they only own 6% of the founder equity, right? So there's a gap there too. So there's something also happening in the cap, cap tables against the, the women founders and, and likely um, also um, people of color as well, though I don't think yeah. that there's data there yet. Um, yeah, there's a reason so, why. Yeah. Because there's not enough data. Mm -hmm. Not because yeah. we have it, like it's because there aren't enough people to have enough data that Oof. represent those groups. Hmm. It's, it's tough. Yeah. So, okay. So, well, let's, let's talk about some solutions. Um, so, and, and I also, if, if, if we have time, I also want to get to the, the product side too, because I think that's another component is, is also yes. products because um, you, you talked about, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm just going to say it now because I have it on my mind. As you talked about the, the, the wealth that the tech industry has generated in San Francisco, in the world at this point, and lots of different parts of the world. And, and it's all, it's been generated around products as well that um, have an impact on the world, one way or the yes. other, good or bad um, for some people and maybe not for other people in the world too, right? And so, yes. so that is another component of this that I, that I wanna, wanna touch on. But this, this first kind of touch on some of the, the details around how do we, how, how are you thinking about those solutions that you, you talked about? At, absolutely. Um, let's see. Well, for one, we we are intentionally building our firm differently. Um, mm. We, uh, you know, one one thing that I noticed as I was, like I said, doing my tour of duty down on Sand Hill Road, trying to figure out where I might fit into the ecosystem. Um, what I what I quickly learned is that the majority of VC firms don't actually post their jobs online. Mm -hmm. Coming from tech, you know, most jobs are posted. Um, now, how those applications are managed and handled and the interview processes uh, still leave uh, little to be desired, um, which unfortunately, uh, unfortunately gives job security for you uh, because companies need to be trained on how to hire uh, inclusively. Mm -hmm. um, but at least their jobs are posted, right? In venture, the jobs weren't even hitting web pages uh, because they were literally being gifted to uh, people in their immediate networks. And so the role of investor specifically is very, very, very rarely uh, uh, posted. And so people don't even have the opportunity to apply. Uh, whereas the reality is, is the role of investor there are so many backgrounds where the skills are incredibly transferable. Uh, you do mm -hmm. not need to have gone and, and worked in the banking industry. Uh, I mean, like I, like I shared earlier, like the majority of the, the challenges that, that I, or the opportunity for challenges to be solved or supported by venture capitalists are these really heavy, meaty people problems. And, you know, I think, I think if the last few years have shown us anything, it's that there, <laughs> Money is not necessarily the the solution that our companies have needed over the last few years. You know, we've we are still in survival mode here. We've got a global pandemic. We've got uh, the, this reckoning with race here in America. Women's rights are under attack. Our LGBTQIA plus community is still fighting for basic rights. Our children are petrified to go to school, um, mm. and that's because the schools just reopened because they were closed for so long. You know, we we've got so so much at play in the world around us right now that, you know, it, it's a little pre-seed check is not the thing that is really the, the, the opportunity that venture capital has to really support their, their companies and help them be successful through this. These are mm. heavy, heavy people problems. And so, um, uh, I, I digress. I, I lost myself in this thought. I was saying that we, 
venture capitalists and firms are not posting their roles. So we are not able to tap into other skill sets that are very, very transferable. And, and like I said, skills that are not actually going to be coming out of the banking industry for one, mm -hmm. uh, to support right. the companies and founders that are needed right now. Those two things could not be further from, from one another. So, so one mm -hmm. thing that Alexis and I uh, committed to doing before we even had a name for the firm and something that we still do today um, is we our commitment to open uh, applications. So for every role at our firm, we post the job. Uh, we very we very clearly articulate what it is, what it is not, uh, and and we take it even further. Uh, we we do um, we run our applications through a an algorithmic process where we we have an intake form. So it's the same for every single human. We don't accept resumes. We do not accept uh, uh, warm introductions. Everyone is filtered to the exact same uh, online form. That goes into um, a system that. Uh, will hide names um, of the applicants. And then we, we run through our process of identifying uh, both the, the skill sets uh, needed for that particular role, but then also a little bit about their perspective and their worldview. So we, we are not asking for demographics up front, but we, what we are asking, uh, one of my favorite questions to ask in, in interviews, um, and this has, has been the case since you and I worked together, uh, which is, uh, what else would you like to share about your identity mm. and let people mm. fill the space? It is beautiful. What people come back to you with, you learn so much more about who they are, not just as professionals, but as humans who are moving about this world. Um, I will, I, I will. And I do, I do not accept resumes. Uh, but I will take that question. Uh, mm -hmm. every single day, because it tells me so much that I need to know about you with your permission. So mm -hmm. it tells me, so if you want to include in that, tell me about your identity question, if you want to include that you were an HR executive at company X, fantastic. That's a big part mm -hmm. of your identity. I love that you shared that. Mm -hmm. If you choose to share 20 other things, uh, but never once share a, a name of a company or a logo, great. That's what you want to share with me, right? And so, all of our applications come in. They go through this process, and then, uh, and then we begin the the on-site process. Of, well, virtually on-site of of uh, having those conversations and furthering the uh, the the interview process. And again, in our attempt to uh, not just operate in the one-to-one -one mode, uh, we've open sourced this work. And so something that's very, very important to us is sharing our process uh, with the rest of venture capital in hopes that they adopt some of these, these best practices, mm -hmm. or I shouldn't call them best practices yet, uh, these, these learnings uh, mm -hmm. that we have found and made and discovered. And so I, what, I, what I commit to do um, is not just share the things that are going well or the things that we are doing that, that we're proud of, but also kind of where we got things wrong. That's um, that's because- great. Don't, you don't need to learn my mistakes. And also this is all new and, and we are far from perfect. And, you know, we're going to stumble, we're going to fall. We're going to, we're going to, you know, we're humans <laughs> and we are humans <laughs> who are trying to change a system uh, that was not made even for people like me uh, mm -hmm. is how I feel. And so, you know, being able to share our learnings as we go, um, this, this idea of building out loud or building in public has become really important to us. And so, so that's one solution open your applications, <laughs> run a fair and equitable, uh, and, and do your best to reduce bias through that, that hiring process so that you get more people in the door, learning about venture capital. Obviously, you know, not every role in, in VC can be a check writing position, but every role is going to have an impact on how, you know, at least at our firm, the companies that we select, the founders we invest in, and more importantly, how we help support them as mm -hmm. they grow through the different stages. So, you know, we view this as a long-term relationship. This is not write a check and walk away. This is write a check and, and partner and be a part of a community together, several communities together. Um, mm -hmm. Um, and, and to your point, Melinda, of, you know, if we can change the face of, of the, uh, the investors, if we can help bring more perspective to that check writing position, that will then influence that founder uh, representation, which will then influence the employee pool mm -hmm. and, and that, that talent development, what that looks like in those perspectives, which will then in turn impact the people who are actually using these products. 
they will be, again, this is my hope, my belief, my theory. I, I, I will die on this hill. <laughs> Our products will be more inclusive. They will help more people live better lives uh, and make our world a better place. And uh, again, there's a lot of hope in these statements, <laughs> mm-hmm. a lot of it. But I, yeah. I do feel, and again, this is the part that I mentioned earlier, I'm not dropping the C from venture capital. If we can do those things, we actually will yield higher returns. We will create those outsized returns. If you are able to sell your products to more people and more people can actually use them in their everyday lives, you're going to make more money. Mm -hmm. And then that, that wealth flywheel goes back up, right? And so if you're thoughtful about it, and if you want to go a step further, something else that we do, um, as we think about that, that stack of, of, uh, creating wealth, uh, a lot of venture capitalists will not uh, share or publish their their LP data. LP stands for limited partner. Those are the investors' investors. This was something that I had not even considered when I was poking about the, the you know the, in the HR world of where do we go from here. Um, I had not even considered where that money comes from. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fun fact, investors or venture capitalists, they are not investing very much their own money. They are investing Mm -hmm. other people's money. Those people matter because that is where the majority of the wealth goes. Most VC firms split their returns 80-20. 80% go to those LPs, those investors, investors. If you do not investigate who those people are, it doesn't matter how inclusive or diverse the rest of that, that, that whole stack is. If you're putting money into the hands of people who are making decisions that, that you are not values aligned with, we still have a problem. Mm-hmm. And so here, here at our firm, and something that we, we challenge other VC firms to do is we, we actually publish our LP data around demographics. Um, we have a very, very thorough uh, uh, diversity report. Um, so we run a, a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging survey with our LPs. We have made the commitment, and so far we have have stuck to this um, at least. And I won't give away all of our numbers exactly because we're about to publish a new a new bout. Um, hmm. But we we have committed to maintaining at least fifty percent uh, female non-binary uh, representation on our hmm. cap table, uh, and fifteen percent black or indigenous. We we want our investor pool and community to reflect the world in which we live. Finding that has been challenging Mm -hmm. and it's taken us longer to raise our funds than than, than we had planned for or we would have liked. And it has been worth every single Mm. second and ounce of energy and ounce of resource. And, And the thing that I am so excited about as well is that of our LPs, we also survey the question before we take their checks, um, what are they doing with their money? Um, are they putting any of that back into their communities? And uh, the vast majority of our LPs do put their money back into the communities. And uh, 50% of those returns, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking at my report right now as we speak. We will be publishing it. But uh, I believe that of the people who are, of the, our investors who are putting their money back into the community, which is the vast majority, uh, 50% of that are going to the BIPOC communities. Um, wow. So if you really, really care about changing the distribution of wealth, uh, right now I'm speaking specifically about America, uh, but, but we can, we can go all the way. Mm. (laughs) You've got to be looking at that LP base. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, so, uh, we're, we're winding down. We have just a a few minutes here. Um, and I wanted, I do want to get to the product side just a little bit. Um, maybe we can just kind of touch on it. Um, you invest in people first companies, which I love. And also um, you're thinking about which every invest, every, every firm at this point should be thinking about web three. Right. And it's, I will say it's scary for, for some of us kind of looking on the outside the quick emergence that um, uh, on the one hand, some people say it's democratizing creativity and potentially wealth. I am not, I'm not sure yet. And on that, and, and it's definitely not showing environmental sustainability or regulation and all of the things that, um, that, that we have in, in other big 
wealth generating um, uh, areas, industries. And so for, please, um, can you just say a little bit about what you're thinking in terms of how do we build that accountability and inclusion and sustainability in Web3 from an investor standpoint? And maybe just briefly, what is Web3 too, for anybody who doesn't know? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I'm glad you asked. Uh, right now, I feel like our our industry is trying to figure out how to define it. Um, mm. And, and you, you could ask five different people and get five different answers on this one. Um, mm. Recognizing we don't have a ton of time here, I, I will say very quickly, um, uh, let's see, what is Web3? Um, I will start by saying it is not a vertical. So there are still some people who are saying like, oh, I, I want to invest in Web3. And I think even somewhere in my online profiles, it says like I invest in Web3. Uh, it, is, it is not a vertical. It's not like fintech or health tech or, or education. It's, it's when we say Web3, we're actually talking about the, the, the next generation um, of, of technological evolution, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mentioned earlier, like, you know, we, when we were building this last generation, what we now know as Web2, we didn't call it Web2 then, we called it tech, right? You would right. say like, oh, I work in tech. Mm -hmm. and, and all of our friends who didn't work in tech knew it, right? Um, but we didn't call it Web2. Uh, but this is, this is the same as saying like, um, when you want to invest in Web3 or you work in Web3, uh, it's, it really is the investment in or the, the commitment to this next chapter for our whole industry. Um, it's so much more than cryptocurrency, NFTs, DAOs, like all of this. That's the fast build that you're talking about what's happening. You know, mm -hmm. oh, I, I work for a Web3 company. I'm building something on chain or, or you know, I could give 100,000 examples of all of the mm -hmm. isms that are out there. But mm -hmm. um, if, if Web1 was about reading the internet, you know, that was when the internet was brought to us and, and became a part of, of homes and, and households. And, and then web two was really about like the, the content creation um, on the internet and how we interacted with it. So think Facebook, Twitter, uh, Reddit, uh, these places where we were creating our content and interacting with it and, and the implications thereof. Um, mm -hmm. Web three really is more about ownership and for me, accountability, which is what mm. I, I love about how you framed it, because with ownership comes intrinsically accountability. Mm. And um, the uh, when, when I say ownership, it, it's like, who owns your information? Who owns your content? Who owns your digital assets? And, and, and in Web3, the answer is you do. You own hmm. that uh, because it's built on blockchain technology, uh, which we absolutely don't have time for me to try to describe. Uh, there's yeah. a block, it's on a chain, right? There's a whole thing. <laughs> there's lots of servers every, all yeah. over the world. Yeah. So, that's a big all. thing. Yeah, just trust us. <laughs> don't trust people who say trust me. Um, <laughs> uh, but but Web3 is, is literally going to be a part of every business, um, I believe. It's going to be a part of every single business uh, from... Uh, uh, you know, gaming to finance to medical records, education, the whole the whole shebang. So, so for me, Web three is our chance to not only make a better internet, which is the promise, right? We're, we're being promised Web three. We can build a better internet. Um, great, I love that. That sounds wonderful. Sign me up. Uh, but, but it, the opportunity here really is, I think, to make better products that serve their communities and help create these new economies. Again all of those things will have an impact on all of the things that we've mm. discussed today. And, and so I think that what we have in front of us right now is the opportunity to create a more fair, inclusive, and transparent experience for everyone. And, and this is why I love my job so much, uh, because I believe that we can do that. And I, I know that we need to, to wrap it up here. So I will say our opportunity that, that really is sitting in front of us right now um, is, is highly dependent on our investors, where we are deploying capital, uh, the founders that we are choosing to invest in, these standards uh, that we need to hold them accountable to as they grow and scale. Because I, I lived through the birth of Web2. I, mm -hmm. I was a, a very lucky participant in, in that boom and, and the excitement that that brought and the feeling that we have today in tech is exactly what I felt what, like 13, 14 years ago uh, when I got into it, where there, there is the opportunity to do so much right. But the difference is for today is that, that you know, as we are sitting here on the precipice of Web3, if that feeling is exactly the same as Web2, like the, that, ooh, there's a moment here, the window is open, the opportunity is ripe, but the difference is, is that we're coming to this conversation and we're, we're coming to this opportunity um, 
with lessons learned. Um, mm, yes. and, and if we do not carry those lessons with us specifically around diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging, we will have blown it. And, and we will have blown it to the tune of billions of dollars, again, to put a very fine point on the financial impact here. And, and so I have a lot of heart in that I do see venture capital shifting and changing in terms of who that investor, uh, you know, what that investor archetype is and what it looks like. Uh, I am hopeful that that will start, we'll start to see the, the, the downstream effects of that shift um, and that growth that, that we're seeing on the venture side. Um, and you know, I, I really, I, I really, really, really do feel like this next generation of both founders and of, of employees and, and frankly, the world at large, the, the culture that has been created that's coming out of the last two years is exhausted and it doesn't have time and it doesn't have space uh, for BS, <laughs> for exclusion, for not being considerate of the whole. And that includes the environment and, and the impact of climate. I think that we are going to start. So like I said, I, I said that I would make this snappy and I lied. For me, Web3 is about ownership and it's about accountability. And, and that accountability, I think, is going to play a huge, huge role from the consumer perspective, holding companies and, co and, and corporations and investors accountable uh, to all of the things that are going to impact the way in which we live and, and work with one another and engage with one another, how we build our products, uh, to employees rising up and saying, nah, -uh, not on our watch. Uh, and, and again, I really, really do hope to see a lot more investors and venture capital firms uh, holding their, their founders accountable to this and really helping them, them build for the, the world in which we actually live. That's my soapbox. <laughs> On Web3. I love it. I love it. And we always end with one with with an action that people can take. And you just did. You just did. You shared consumers um, that we hold hold um, hold products, hold companies uh, accountable for those learnings and that sustainability and inclusion that we care about for employees as well, for investors really doing that work. And you're 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 providing the tools and resources for people to kind of learn from what you're doing, and then the founders as well. The founders building products that that are really built sustainably, equitably, inclusively for all of us. I love it. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you so much. Yeah, really great talking with you. I really appreciate you as always. Um, and um, I look forward to our next connection. And, and for all of you, I, we will see you and hear, um, you will hear from us next week. To learn more about this episode's topic, visit ally.cc. Allyship is a journey. It's a journey of self-exploration, learning, unlearning, healing, and taking consistent action. And the more we take action, the more we grow as leaders and transform our communities. So what action will you take today? Please share your actions and learning with us by emailing podcast at changecatalyst.co or on social media, because we'd love to hear from you. And thank you for listening. Please subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel and share this. Let's keep building allies around the world. Leading with Empathy and Allyship is an original show by Change Catalyst, where we build inclusive innovation through training, consulting, and events. Appreciate you listening to our show and taking action as an ally. See you next week.